Whether you're focusing on business, brand, or your professional development, while you are dealing with the matters that are impacting your here and now, you also have to have your sights set for what's next. We're speaking with leaders on their personal journeys, on their stories, on how they have addressed the challenges of today while setting the stage for tomorrow. So here we go. But by way of background, George is from Opelika, Alabama, That's right? right? That's right. Um, the booming metropolis of yeah. Opelika, Alabama. And he is also a Morehouse man. That's what I'm uh, talking about right there. And really set forth, he, and I've read a lot about George Bandy Sr., which we'll talk about a little bit. Yep. Um, but George has really set his entire career based on sustainability and purpose and loyalty and trust and just an awesome, awesome human. So um, by way of this, kind of talk to me about, I know you went to Morehouse and um, you know how that all came to be and then how you went through your career and your journey. Sure. Um, first of all, I'm excited to see everybody here. It's great always to to have an opportunity to just share a little bit of kind of the journey. I don't, I don't think there's a destination in a sustainability career. I think it's like a journey uh, with a purpose. And sometimes your purpose alters, but uh, so I started at Morehouse and um, in 1990, I was supposed to graduate, but uh, got called to Iraq. I was in the reserves. So it delayed my graduation for a year. When I came back, um, one of my favorite professors was Dr. Robert Bullock who is known as the father of environmental justice. He was teaching at Clark Atlanta University School. They had co-collaborated classes between Morehouse, Clark, and Spelman. And so I went back to talk to Dr. Bullard about my experience and you know, kind of my pathway going forward. And he gave me a couple of articles to read. And one of the articles was by a gentleman by the name of Paul Hawken. So he also told me that Paul Hawken would be speaking over at uh, Georgia Tech later on in that week. And I ended up going over there. Of course, Ray Anderson was there, Paul Hawken was there, a couple other people were there that ended up being very notable in the profession and um, had a brief conversation and Paul Hawken invited me to come and take a natural step training. And uh, unbeknownst to me at that time that my career would be altered for forever at that particular moment. So I always like to give Dr. Robert Bullitt, who's now uh, one of the faculty, leading faculty at Texas Southern University, um, and known for writing like eight books on environmental justice, everything from the Flint, Michigan issues to down in Cancer Alley in New Orleans. Um, great, great faculty guy, and I still try to keep in touch with him, but he's super busy. Um, anyway, that, that catapulted me to go to this, was supposed to be a month long natural step training. I ended up staying for six months in Sausalito, California. And um, unbeknownst to me, there were three faculty members from the University of Texas in Houston, Health Science Center, that were looking for a sustainability officer and they recruited me out of that class to come and be the first sustainability officer at an institution of higher learning uh, at that moment. Um, John Pareto and Brian Yeoman were the leaders of that organization at that time. And, um, from there, my career kind of took off. What was the institu uh, higher institution? The University of Texas in Houston Health Science Center. So it started out being just um, housed in their School of Public Health. They were calling themselves the Modern Health Science Center of the 21st century, and they had four sick buildings on campus. Mm. So they wanted to try to address these issues through the School of Public Health through training, teaching these formats around the natural step. So I think that you'll probably ask me questions about the natural step moving well, I'd forward. Well, I'd love to hear so. more about the natural step. <laughs> so, so the natural step is a framework uh, for sustainable thinking, and um, it gives you a systematic approach to looking at sustainability. One of the things that I love about the natural step is every career that I've had, I've been able to leverage the natural step in order to be effective uh, at the job, because you can find uh, solutions and systematic thinking. Oftentimes what happens with people who embark upon sustainability, they find one aspect, actually David Gerson and I were talking about this earlier, is that they only harp on the science without looking at the social impacts of the science. Or they only harp on the social impacts without thinking about the science or the business aspect. 
the one thing I love about the natural step system conditions is that there's four systems conditions. So they sound really complicated, but I'll try to make them relatively simple. Um, substances from the Earth's crust cannot systematically increase in nature. What does that mean? That means you can't take things from the Earth's crust continuously without putting them back. The Earth is a system and we only have so much, right? And you can't take mercury, oil, whatever those substances are, and put them into the atmosphere without having a system from Mother Nature to put them back into the Earth's crust. System condition number two is that of these substances we take from the Earth's crust, we can't heat, beat, and treat them and make them more difficult for Mother Nature to put them back. So PVCs, BDTs, all these different things that we create based on our desire to make something more durable. Think about how many laptops, phones, Palm Pilots, I'm dating myself, you know, <laughs> things that we've, cameras, like all the things, TVs, projectors, all the things that we've made really durable that we've taken from the Earth's crust and asked Mother Nature to deal with, but at the same time, We've also asked her to deal with the complexity that we give her back, right? So just because you take oil, turn it into gas, and then liquefy it, it still stays in the atmosphere, right? It goes from a liquid to a gas, but it's still here, creating pressure on nature to be able to take what we've created and turn it back into something that we can use. Third system condition is basically photosynthesis. Right? It's the only way that takes what we breathe out and turn it into something that Mother Nature can use again to provide resources to us to sustain life. And the fourth one, which is usually the one that gets most complexity, is the one that says that you cannot also privatize the wealth and socialize the risk. Meaning that we go out and we make all these great manufacturing facilities during the Industrial Revolution, not thinking about the impact on the people or the global impact on the climate or the impact on people that we haven't even seen, future generations, as Ray used to call them, tomorrow's child, uh, and the impacts that we're having on them. So I always talk about the fact that I, I, I love to go to middle, elementary, and high schools to talk, because it keeps me young, for one. I try to keep my dress code according to them, but, um, but it also reminds me of these eras of what they think. They really think it's our fault, and to a certain extent it is because we hadn't thought about the compact of what we were doing in that short frame of time during the Industrial Revolution and the impact of what it was going to mean to future generations going forward. And so that compact time that we were just all about take, make, waste, right? Waste was a calculation that we accepted. We didn't think about its impact on those generations of people that are coming behind us, and also those areas that sometimes people don't look at as the areas that they are most attractive and those communities that have a lot of manufacturing facilities but don't have a lot of outlets, and those types of things that are actually being shipped off sea. So I, I, I was thinking about this on the way over here, is that what happens when a state no longer can build landfills? You do know that there's some states that no longer can build landfills. They're at their capacity. Well, they ship their stuff to other countries or to third world cities in the U.S. that actually take that waste. Well, what happens when we run out of space to be able to do that, right? That's another form of privatizing the wealth and socializing the risk and not having responsibility for these materials that are really complex. Um, so there's a system that you need to take into consideration. I'm pro-business, but I'm pro-business for strategic, sustainable, and approaches that make sense. I think sometimes we have these businesses that pop up, they don't last very long because they don't, you know, if you're, or you're a pencil maker and you run out of trees, you just run out of business, right? So you have to be thinking about like, what is the sustainable solution that we can create? And if things need to be in a technical loop, you create that technical loop. And you have to invest in that technical loop because that's part of keeping your business to become more sustainable. You know, oftentimes you see these things in the industry and people are always baffled by them and I'm always laughing, right? You know, you had, you know, well, we can't get any cars because you can't get these little transistors. Well, what the hell happened to all the ones that you made before that, right? We just made them, we leased the cars, we sold the cars, and then we let them go into the landfill. Wouldn't it have been smart to be able to recycle those back into the same material that you could use all over again? Same thing with the touch screen on the phone, right? Apple's probably about 80% of their phone gets recycled back into their phone. Think about this. 
Best business model I've ever seen. I got to take this phone back, give it to you, right? To get another phone at another $1,700 and then sign up for a contract for three to four years. And the only way I can get another phone is bring you all the raw materials back so you can create me another phone. So they're buying 20% raw materials, selling you a 100% phone, and you're giving them the material to make your phone with. Pretty good process, right? Smart business. Good business decision. So how do we become more effective about how we deliver those types of services? Because people just want the service of the phone. They don't actually care about actually owning a phone. They don't actually care about owning a laptop. So the service of what it is that these, some of these materials provide are more important. How do you feel like the, you know, the leasing is growing on automobiles? Because the value of it drops 30% as soon as you drive off the parking lot. So financially, it makes sense not to actually own the vehicle. It makes sense to lease it. So like finding ways to shift the way that we move and a passion around which people work. And I'm so glad that Dr. Bullitt was not trying to convince me to dive all the way into environmental justice, but to see that there's a scope and a range of opportunities around environmental professions that actually were gonna be involved in business, involved in education, involved in so many different facets of what we need, NGOs, and it's exciting to see this whole manifestation. So I, I do have a philosophy around why some of the corporations have struggled. So I'll well, do, just, t do tell. Do tell. <laughs> do tell. <laughs> um, I think that the emergence of sustainability was a buzzword and people got excited about it. They really didn't understand it. And unfortunately, business tries to find ways to transition to what's popular in order to make themselves relevant and create a brand or an image in the marketplace without actually doing what needs to be done, which is building trust, gaining relationships, um, building a culture, looking at some of those things that really need to happen behind the scenes. Um, so I, I, I would venture to say that a lot of people were sitting in these pods called environmental health and safety in the 80s the buzzword of the 90s became sustainability. I think around 96, the President's Council for Sustainable Development under the Clinton administration, which Ray was Ray Anderson from Interface was kind of leading the charge. Um, there were several other people who were really working, Paul Hawk and Amory Lovins. I mean, I can call a litany of names, but that's when it became kind of popular and business began to kind of recognize that there needed to be a shift. Um, during that shifting time, a lot of the businesses were like, ah, that's never going to really grab a hold. It's kind of like, you know, it's just one of those political things that's in passing. And the more and more it began to evolve. So the people who were sitting in these seats around environmental health and safety all of a sudden became people who were moved over to these sustainability roles. Those are two different roles. Environmental health and safety is focused on ISO and OSHA and some of those things around health and safety. And those things have a part of sustainability, but sustainability is more about looking holistically at the business and developing a strategy that allows you to go to market with materials, services, tools, whatever it is that you offer in a different way and creating a pathway to do R&D around those particular issues and creating a culture that allows everybody to be able to speak the same conversation about that transition. These people weren't really equipped to do that and you're asking them to do it. Some of them adapted, most of them did not. Then you created this CSR position. So you move from EH&S to sustainability to corporate social responsibility. And that has evolved to what? This ESG role, mm -hmm. right? So the language has changed and the role has morphed. And the reason why they created the ESG role because they wanted to include governance, which included a lot of other things related to the things that are around sustainability, but the job has grown and it's grown with the maturity of thinking about the entire business. ESG is more about how do we add value to the bottom line in the marketplace around these specific things and address environmental, social, and governance issues. It's the first time that they've connected the financial relativity to the environmental, social, and governance aspects of thinking about business. So these have been four roles 
in 10 years. Four different roles in major corporate entities in 10 years, right? I'm always amazed at how, are there any HR professionals in here? Wow. <laughs> sure, I'm, I'm sorry ahead of time. <laughs> it, it, people in HR have a very difficult job, right? The, the, the most difficult job is attracting and retaining talent with a company that does not have a culture that attracts and retains people. That's difficult to do, right? Because it, it and this younger generation is more prone to leave. They don't care for six months or six years. They'll leave because they have a different perspective. And part of their perspective is our fault, right? So I was just telling David about my, my oldest daughter. She did an undergrad at UGA and now she's uh, graduated med school at Howard and now she's doing physical and occupational therapy in DC. And so right after she graduated UGA, she's like, Dad, I'm, I'm, I want to travel. I want to hit a couple countries, blah, 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 blah. I need your points. <laughs> <laughs> and I need your checkbooks. <laughs> uh, and I was like, nah, well, I mean, you need to wait until you get a job and this, that, and the other. And she says, I don't want to do what you did. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? She said, I watched you get up every day and go to work to at some point at the end of your life be able to go and travel and enjoy life. She said, I want to enjoy it while I'm young enough to be able to enjoy it. So they've watched us work every day really, really hard and go and travel for business and really not enjoy it, complain about it, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so like they don't want to wait until that. And so they've experienced that by watching us. And so their perspective is different. They've watched us stay in jobs we don't like. They've watched us be mistreated in different ways at work that we don't like. And their experience is a little bit different and they have access to way more data than we ever had access to. They don't know what microfiche and microfilm even is, <laughs> right? And reading a newspaper is like, I'm gonna skim these notes online. For us, it was like we had to read the whole article and then go back and highlight it and figure out what we wanted to talk about. So that whole evolution of thinking is, and it morphs every two or three years, like that next generation is changing even faster. And so being able to sustain their attention is a little bit more difficult. And what attracts them is different than what attracted me. And I think that sometimes we've got to accept that, right? You know, that old, you know, lab technician with the pocket protector and the big thick glasses like that. I mean, they're coming in with a hoodie and a skateboard and able to do the same work. Uh, in less time and they don't want to be there if they don't have to be there and for us it's kind of like oh this is a nine to five job and they're kind of like it only took me three hours to do it like don't I get compensated for the same thing like those are the kind of conversations that are evolving and these all are under the umbrella of the evolution of sustainability being able to compete so there's a decline in living systems I don't think anybody would question that right we only got so much earth and there's an increase in population affluence and technology. Well, there's a margin for action for business, right? And there's defensive businesses and then there's strategic businesses. A defensive business hits the wall because they go one direction very, very hard. So I'm in the fashion industry right now. Yesterday, H&M had an article where they're not focused on climate change and they've been not telling the truth about some things that they're doing. That's called hitting the wall, right? And then you bounce back and you go the exact opposite direction. Oh, we're gonna funnel all of our resources toward this. Then you hit another wall, right? And you continue to spend all your time doing this. Years ago in 90s, Nike did the same thing with the labor issues that they had with the people who were making their shoes. Hit the wall and then they bounced back, but they ended up getting very strategic to try to stay in that gap for a longer period of time. They diversified their portfolio. They thought about what they were doing, looked at their materials in a different way. That's the difference between a strategic enterprise and a defensive one. Some of the defensive ones never make it back. Some of y'all still got that Palm Pilot in the closet. <laughs> nah. That, that, that Blackberry, right? So how do we get better? So how do we meet? Oh, wow. Um, at Interface. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I was there a few years before you. And when you came on board, the culture shift needed to be accelerated, I would say. And I think that you worked with the team there and we were able to kind of partner. And I remember the first time you called me to your office and we sat down and we talked about like, what's important about sustainability. And I think the thing that made our relationship so significant is that you asked me about me first and then started asking me about what I did and why I did it. And um, I think our connectivity was built on culture and customer, right? Um, I am big on understanding what my customer desires and figuring out how to give them that in a sustainable fashion. Talk to me a little bit about Ray. And as, <laughs> I don't know if everybody knows who Ray is, so talk tell them about so when I was at wow I, I looked at this this morning so when I was at the University of Texas in Houston our flooring was provided by interface and um, we started getting questions about can we recycle it is any good how do we do this why are we using carpet tiles versus broad loom like all of these conversations and so Ray Gerald Bogue and Mike Bertolucci came down and Jim Hartsfield came down to talk to the university about why, and we had a huge footprint. Most people don't know this, but the largest medical facility in the United States next to the density of New York City is University of Texas Houston Health Science Center. Hmm. Yeah, largest, biggest cancer treatment facility. It's really interesting that it's the largest cancer tre treatment facility and has the most cancer inhibiting materials in that region around Houston New, uh, and New Orleans, Louisiana. That's, I, yeah. it's funded in a different way, but I, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but met Ray. And Ray was the CEO, CEO of Interface. Interface. Yeah. And uh, Jim Hartsville was heading up sustainability. Mark Bertolucci was over the research and development lab. And they were talking about this sustainable solution and how they were gonna create this product. And so we end up having these just rigorous conversations for about an hour. And Ray looked at me in that meeting in front of all those people at UT, says, you're gonna work for me one day. I'm like, shit, go ahead, man. <laughs> so I, I'm never thinking that. Um, and we got into a negotiation about something called an evergreen lease. And I, I looked it up this morning, I still have a copy of it. Dan Hendricks, who's now, he was the CEO, is now the chairman of the board at Interface. He was the CFO at that time, right? And we were negotiating on how to do an evergreen lease, which means that the university would never actually own the carpet. We would lease the carpet, which gives us a ability to kind of predict how much we would spend on carpet annually. Because, you know, usually when you build a building, carpet and furniture aren't included in the price, right? And then you got to go and try to figure out how to do this. So as big as our campus was, what we were trying to figure out is like, how do we keep it fresh and looking new and not actually have to own that product and be responsible for putting something that we knew had chemical challenges for the landfill in the landfill? And Ray created this evergreen lease and we kept going back and forth. At that time, we couldn't get a financial institution to actually put a value on the flooring which was crazy to me, but there was no financial institution willing to do that. So we did it through our own credit union at the university. And um, we did one space, one of the buildings. It was a school of nursing that we were building during that time. And um, it worked, right? It was one of those things where we felt really good about it. And my boss went crazy and he started saying, I no longer want to buy furniture. I want to lease it. I no longer want to buy <laughs> cars because but to be honest with you, like, I don't know if people here from Georgia State, Georgia Tech. I don't know if you have this thing, but 20 years ago, there used to be this thing called asset management. And because you buy stuff with the taxpayer dollars, you couldn't actually auction it off. So you had this warehouse full of Apple IIe computers old televisions with VCRs with the strap across the top on the wheels, um, <laughs> old vehicles that were no longer working, uh, overhead projectors that people weren't using anymore, 
screens that you used to pull up. Like they had all of this stuff in this warehouse and they had trouble auctioning it off because you could be sued because they were taxpayer dollars that were being used to purchase it. So there was like a lot of ambiguity about that. And we had literally warehouses full of this stuff. And it was kind of like, well, how does this work? Right? Like, how do you, it was the ultimate in an example of managing and having responsibility for waste that you could do nothing with, right? You knew that it was going to cost you to dispose of it, so you just kept putting it up in this warehouse as if it was, <laughs> you were going to just continue to be able to buy a warehouse, and it cost you to buy a warehouse and fill these spaces up. And at that point, we had pivoted to kind of start thinking about doing some things more strategically, and that's how I met Ray. And then in 96, 95 or 96, they had a, a huge um, meeting in Detroit. And I remember that meeting because I think D-Hawk spoke. He was the uh, like C -C CEO of Visa at the time. Um, Paul Hawk and Amory Lovins. It was like this big sustainability forum in Detroit. And uh, that's when Ray actually recruited me. I ended up not going to Interface until 99 because we were in the middle of building a building. But um, Another warehouse. Yeah, another warehouse. But it was so much fun, like, just staying connected, keeping up with what they were doing. And um, I think the one thing that I, I loved about Ray, he never told anybody that I worked for him, ever. All the time that I traveled with him, worked with him until he passed, he never told anybody that I worked for him. He said, George works with me on this pathway to a more sustainable future. So I have a, this is not on script. Um, what was your favorite job? Wow. Father. Father. Being a father. Being a father. I love that's it. That's my favorite job. Tell me about your father. That. Wow. Uh, that's where I learned to be a father. Um, my dad, this is, this is going to sound really crazy, but my dad, my grandfather had a lot of businesses growing up. So my dad moved around a lot. Um, and my father came back to Morehouse at 47 years old and graduated in 85. I came to Morehouse in 86. So he said he was going to demonstrate for me what it meant. He graduated in three years, summa cum laude at Morehouse with a double major in finance and religion. Went back to Opelika, became the first black city councilman, first black county commissioner, and then got elected to uh, be the first black house representative in District 83 while pastoring the largest church in Opelika. Um, what were the, he he what died were the... in that seat five years ago. Wow. So uh, his, his principles and values were very strong. <laughs> um, he was uh, very passionate about people and life and fairness and understanding connectivities between people, um, but also very passionate about what he wanted for me. And that was to, you know, be able to work in a field that I was passionate about. And so he said it didn't have to be what he wanted me to work in, but it had to be in something that I appreciated and loved. And I found that, that pathway. Interesting enough, I remember working for the summer youth employment program when I was a senior in high school. And as soon as I got the job, I think it was paying like four, three dollars and seventy something cents an hour or something like that. I don't know some of y'all are looking like, wow. <laughs> um, and my dad walked in after I got my first check and he handed me the cable bill and the water bill. <laughs> nope. No, and I mean, he didn't bat an eye. He's like, this is yours for the summer best lesson I could have ever learned. You recently told me about the, he, there's four legacies or four parts of a career. Do you remember telling me about this? Yeah. But what, 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 it was great advice. So um, he used to always talk about there's four things that you want to you wanna create your pathway. You want to 
provide services to people and touch people and bring value to other people. You want to have impact that you cannot even see and you want to leave a legacy of what it is that you've done. And so that was like his gift to me was to help me understand that there was more to a career than just going to work and coming home every day, is that you had an obligation to have an impact on other people in different ways and lift them at the same time. And so I try to keep that in balance. So it's one of the reasons why we may disagree um, but I always try to give people options to understand my perspective. Um, whether we agree on that perspective or how we get there is, you know, that, that creates good, rich dialogue. Uh, but I, I, I think that I always give people the option to leave with the same dignity they came with. I think that sometimes people lose sight of that. Um, being right does not give you the ability to talk down to other people. And sometimes we lose side of having the comfort of respecting the fact that people come from different perspectives. I, I this kind of led me to this story. I, I, used to be, I used to be the chairman of the United States Green Building Council, got elected when I was working at Interface. Um, but we went and we had the, um, the actual green bill was being held in New Orleans. And I went down for a week early because it was right after the hurricane. Never forget this, big hurricane. So um, went down and can I say it? Home Depot. Uh, hopefully they're here. They're not. Okay. Home Depot was down there. They had just created like these versions of the nest, right? And they had redone a few people's homes and they were walking around giving out these LED bulbs because they were trying to get people to be more sustainable. And they go to this lady's house and, and I, I'm looking at this lady. I'm like, she looks like she could be across the street at my grandma's in, in Opelika house coat, distinguished lady, gray hair, and they were trying to talk to her and I'm listening to the conversation and the guy was like, hey, you need to buy these LED bulbs, you know, we're gonna give you one, but you should buy more of them. She says, well, how much they cost, baby? And he told her, and it was like four times the cost of a regular bulb. And she looked him right in his eye and said, baby, if I gotta choose between a light bulb and my medicine, I choose my medicine all day. That moment, I kind of recognize like perspective of sustainability means more than actual value. So when you hear people talking about, hey, you should be doing this because the climate change is bad. You got to know who you're talking to, because some of the people you're talking to are people who <laughs> you've given that impact to. Like, imagine talking to somebody in Puerto Rico after the storm about they had nothing to do with a lot of the climate change impact that caused that hurricane to hit their area. Now you're talking to them about contributing to helping you fix a problem that you're creating on this side of the country. You gotta think about like where people are and give perspective around some of your conversations. And I think that that's one of the probably most valuable lessons I learned is my grandfather used to say you should have two ears and one mouth. And that means you should listen two times more than you talk. So sometimes you got to absorb where people are, ask the right questions, listen to kind of their perspective, and then learn from that. And that applies not just um, in that particular setting, but even in corporate settings or in business settings. I think sometimes we're so busy trying to get our point across, especially in the marketing space. We're so busy trying to get our point across because we've put so much time and effort into it that we haven't listened to what it is that people actually want. And I think that that's where culture is built, listening to what people actually need and then applying the principles and the concepts and the really innovative ideas that you bring to marketing to have a meeting of getting people, because you want people to want to run through the wall for your cause. Right? And if that's what you want, you got to understand exactly what drives them. And I think sometimes we don't spend enough time figuring out what really inspires and drives people. And it's not always money. So what, which brands do you think get it? Wow. Um, TK, Interface, I gotta give them a shout out to my people. <laughs> um, 
I think that a lot of brands get it. I think that something Patagonia has been out there for a long time. Unilever's been out there doing some great stuff for a long time. I, I, I think for me is more of more brands are getting it. I think that people are just judging them at where they're getting it, right? Like you, you can't expect a company that, you know, just started embarking on sustainability. And I think we're too critical, right? We don't give them a chance to grow in the space that we give them an opportunity to mature because we place judgment. Like it's far too late and far too bad for us to be passing judgment on where people are around sustainability, right? And I also am a big critic of people taking credit for something Mother Nature has done for us for free for so long, right? So now all of a sudden, I'm reducing more carbon than you, so I'm better, right? Okay, well, when did you start counting? Oh, you start counting in 95? Okay, well, what about all the stuff that you made from 95 back to your inception of being created? Like you just decided that that didn't count? So I think that we've got to start looking at how do we make handprints rather than measuring footprints, mm -hmm. right? Because we still owe so much based on the industry. And not just that, but the supply chain of the industry that you're in. Like they weren't calculating either until you start putting pressure on them. So you, you started doing yours and then you started putting pressure on them like 10 years later. So what about all the stuff that was created during that era that also has an impact? Not just an impact on the environment, but also on the social impact of how it impacting people and the stress on mother nature. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that. So I think every small step counts. I think sometimes we just don't acknowledge that. People have gotten so mature in quote unquote their language around sustainability that they lose sight of you know, industries that have struggled to kind of move the needle. And um, we need to be more encompassing around that. I think that that's a societal issue, not just an issue for people in this particular space, in my opinion. So I'm going to make two comments and then we'll open it up for the room. I did send a note, a text last night to Richard French, who we work with at Interface, <laughs> and um, asked him to give me, give me something to say to you. And he said, um, and George speaks around the world. And could, uh, he just was at Spencer Stewart last week at a big conference. He's yeah, off to Mexico City. Um, and George is, you know, world renowned, but he's always, never says anything about it, always humble. He's from Opelika. Oh, yeah. And oh, the yeah. other person is John Wells. He used to be the president of the Americas, <laughs> probably one of my favorite people I've ever yeah, worked with. People. We got the opportunity to work with them. And what he said was that you embody everything that George Sr set out to do yeah. and um so i just want to give you that I appreciate shout out. that um I and then that. for i'd say for the audience or anybody on zoom uh we'd love to have questions or comments anna uh, say who you are who you're with Yeah. What are the three things you would highlight from that playbook? Wow. Uh, humility with dignity. Ray was big on being humble. Um, I think the second thing is looking at where you really are. I think sometimes we start jumping straight into aspiration without looking at what, what, where are we right now so we can level set and then begin to kind of chip away and do the work. So like for me, the playbook is take the four systems conditions, lay it across whatever the business might be, and just start the work. Fortunately or unfortunately, in the fashion industry, it's tough. And um, we're gonna do some things really in the near future that I think are gonna kinda push us in a different direction. Um, I think the other thing about running the playbook is we need more playbook runners. I think that a lot of us started in Ray's camp and we've expanded, but that's what Ray told us from the beginning. And some people have lost that, that you're, you're on a journey. Like you can't get up the mountain with just carpet companies, right? 
There's other companies that also have to go up this mountain sustainability in order for us to have the type of impact that we want to try to have. And when we lose sight of that, I think sometimes we get kind of siloed. And, and you know, as my, my kids can say, sometimes we, we don't fact check. So we need to start fact checking each other and making sure that we're sharing this vision with other people. You know, it's, it's no longer okay for us to privatize the wealth and socialize the risk. That's not acceptable because we can't be successful that way. And there's no way that we're gonna be able to sustain the type of life that we want to have for future generations to be able to enjoy if, if we continue to do that. And I still go back every year and I read The Last Child in the Woods, one of my favorite books, because it reminds me of my humble beginnings, but it also reminds me of like being connected to nature. Um, I told a story to this group about my grandmother who's like the ultimate environmentalist. You know, I, I tell people all the time, I grew up uh, in a farm to table house. So it wasn't like that was extravagant. Like <laughs> you go out, you get the chicken, the hens are outside. We didn't have these egg price issues. And you know, <laughs> you know, most of the stuff that we, my grandfather had a farm, like, so we, we lived this. So I'll never forget my, my grandmother after a really bad storm, she said to me, she said, Baby, you, you know we the only people that get wet when the storm come. I'm like, what? She's like, the animals know before the storm comes and they go and they hide. That's how I know when the storms are coming. We have incubated ourselves inside and we've lost tune of our connectivity with nature. Whereas you never see a storm where there's a lot of deer flying around in the storm. <laughs> Or there are a lot of birds getting caught up in the storm because they're smart enough to detect that things are changing and they go and burrow. They go and hide. But we, on the other hand, feel like we can control nature. And I tell people this and sometimes it, it, I don't like to sound negative, but you do know Mother Nature can fix the climate change problem, but without us. And that people don't want to hear. It actually can happen without us, right? The storms can get so bad that we can't withstand those storms. And so like we've got an opportunity to be able to make things evolve and do things in a more strategic way. And so running the playbook means you just gotta stay the course, stay connected to nature, understand that you know God's not making any more earth like, hey, let's put another thousand acres over here for people to live on. Like, we are being condensed into smaller spaces. And Mother Nature is being asked to handle a lot on our behalf. And we've gotta be smarter about how we actually uh, do that. So, question time. Who else? Uh, I'll go with one. I, you know, you go into a, a, a fast food restaurant with a number of chains and see calories or uh, health mm. information about uh, items. I know you work in e-commerce. Uh, now you're in fast fashion. Uh, do you foresee a world where there'll be transparency on labels as to, instead of just comparing price, you're actually able to compare environmental impact of the items bought? Absolutely. I don't think it's an option. I think that it's uh, an inalienable right for the people who are actually, you know, buying your goods and services uh, to be able to do that. And I think that also it gives you the ability to be able to recycle and create a platform that encourages recycling. Um, and we know this though, Europe has already started that process. Um, when I worked at Amazon, they were big on creating a circular economy model and they were big on that. And, and in Europe, they're fining companies for not having the level of transparency or the level of responsibility. And you're starting to see a few states begin to pick up that extended responsibility uh, legislation that's starting to kind of out on the West Coast um, that's starting to drive things. I think that that's only going to increase um, as we find more and more challenges um, in the marketplace. And so I, I would absolutely see that. You know, they'll fight it for a long time. When I say they, I mean the U.S. is always reluctant um, to kind of give that type of pressure. But I think that over a period of time, you'll see more and more companies voluntarily moving in that space and the competitiveness of a very wise consumer 
will begin to drive that marketplace in a different way. And so it will be encouraged to move in that particular direction to help with, with the things that we're doing for sure. We probably have time for Trisha. Uh, say who you are, where are you yeah, where you work. Um, I'm Trisha Young, a marketing communications hey. in South Face. Hey. Um, so one of the issues I feel like we run into a lot is greenwashing. Mm. So Great I question. hear your comments about you know not discounting small steps, not having some sort of purity test, but how do you balance that with like organizations that are only content to do the small steps yeah. when they could and maybe should do more and how they or content to make small steps look like bigger steps than they are. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um I think there's a lot of third party certification opportunities out there. I I only get concerned when the, the third parties become so prevalent that you need to have like 18 certifications in order to authenticate something, right? Because at that point, the price only goes up to the consumer, right? Because you got to pay for all of these different certifications. My flooring people and my furniture people are like, yeah, right? So, and then, you know, it, they evolve and they change in terms of like, and the price continues to go up as they create infrastructures to foster their business in certain ways. So there's value in that. I think one of the challenges to that is that, um, governmental agencies aren't creating the type of transparent certifications that actually can authenticate certain aspects of things. USDA should be doing some things, EPA should be creating some things, and then therefore that would create things that people trusted enough or that were um, transparent enough for people to be able to see, but that's very, very moderated in that particular space. Um, the greenwashing is um, more of a challenge because we're globalized, right? I'll, I'll give you a, a good example. Um, when I worked at the big capital letter A, so that way I won't get myself in trouble, I remember when there was a, not a certification, but a product declaration that was authenticated. And it had like the name of the company and the brand that we were putting into this particular uh, fashion label. They were creating what's called Amazon Aware, which is like where they have all their climate neutral brands. And so one of their big suppliers who did not have that certification actually cut and pasted it, mm -mm. put it on their product and didn't take the name off the bottom. <laughs> right? And then sent it back to us to authenticate their brand to be added to the website. Right? And it, when you have uh, lots of companies internationally, that's what they do, because they don't have the type of um, certification authenticity that you need. And so there definitely needs to be more rigorous third party verification, but I also think that needs to be balanced and temperamented with um, accepting and allowing people to understand what those small steps are. I think that a lot of the information that's out now kind of makes it easy to expose people who are greenwashing, right? If somebody's numbers have stayed the same for an extended period of time, you kind of know what it is, just because they got a good commercial doesn't mean that they're actually moving the needle. Um, I think that as you begin to increase in that value in different spaces, because just because somebody says they got recycled content, recycle what, right? Like there's a lot of different ways to do that. But I think that if you focus on making sure that the company has a level of trust that they've built with their consumers so that they're looked upon in a certain type of way, and then ask and challenge. I think that challenging some of the others in the industry is a fair thing to do, to get them to move. And then they create their narrative as to how they're going to approach sustainability. Because there's, there's three, four ways, right? You can either go in the brand space, if you're doing mark climate neutrality, right? You're either gonna buy offsets or you're gonna reduce your internal work, right? Then there's bio-based, right? You're gonna move away from what you've been doing from a technical perspective and make things out of things that nature can reproduce over and over again. There's some challenges with that because do you use that agricultural space for other things, right? Do we have enough space to grow corn to make carpet or do we have enough space to grow corn to make corn? And then you can go with recycle, 
And that's either technical or commercial recycling. Like you can look at those different type of aspects. So you've got the climate neutrality, the bio-based, and then you've got the recycling aspect. And then you've got the social impacts of all three of those. So the social impact kind of overarches and the environmental impacts of those decisions overarch. So I think that businesses have multiple platforms from a biophilic to a more technical opportunity to advance. And depending on which or a variety of those and being able to communicate what they're actually doing and how they're having their impact. I think that that's where the struggle usually lies um, versus the challenging people on their greenwashing. I think sometimes they're just trying to do the me too, right? Like, oh, they're doing that? Okay, let me go get a certification so I can say me too. And then they don't even know what they're doing. And that's one of those EHS being moved to an ESG role and not really understanding what that dynamic is and not having that confrontational conversation with the business about what's important and not understanding what your customers want from you as well. And like, those are some of the things that I think will help alleviate that. Do I think that we're there? No, I think certain industries are there because they're more mature. But I think that some of the other industries that are just getting started are struggling to try to figure that out. And that's why you're seeing a lot of them in the press right now. So I think we are, one more. well, we've got one more. All of them, right? None of them wanted to do it. I mean, they, I mean I, I'm going to tell this story. I don't know. You were probably there when this happened. Big board meeting. Stock price at Interface had, fall, had fallen. We're standing there. Ray goes around like a little wall like this. And um, there are some senior folks on this side of the wall. And they say, man, um, Stock price is falling. I think Ray's gone around the bend. They don't know Ray's on the other side of the wall. Ray walks back around and says, I have gone around the bend, and it doesn't look very good if we don't get this shit right. <laughs> right? At that moment, I recognize one thing. If you don't have leadership support, it doesn't matter. You're going to struggle if you don't have leadership. And when I say leadership support, I mean support of the purpose of your organization. It's one thing to kind of be a leader and just say, hey, I want to see you grow up professionally. I want to do this. I want to support you financially. But if they're not supporting the purpose of the organization, you will struggle with moving that. And that was the biggest challenge, that you didn't have a lot of CEOs or CFOs or C-suite executives or VPs even out talking about sustainability just 10 years ago. And it's still a little more now, but not as much. So I think that it's taken some time to infuse and educate and see the value of sustainability at a leadership perspective. And then it's one thing to see it, it's another thing to implement it, right? Seeing it is easy because you can read enough books to be able to say, I get it, right? But like applying it to your actual business and yielding the type of results and having the financial returns that you need to, that's work. And you got to surround yourself with a lot of talented people in order to be able to deliver on that work. And sometimes it means moving away from certain types of strategies that you've had before and capturing broader audiences than you've actually been able to capture before. And that requires a little bit. So I think that any company, the Patagonia is a great example. Interface is a great example. Um, you've seen some success with companies like Amazon. Amazon's done some amazing stuff. They're just so big, they're an easy target. Right? It's like they do some bad stuff, too, and their bad stuff is big, too. So like, you just can't have like, you know, the, the, you, when you start seeing companies that you wouldn't anticipate talking about sustainability, you know that you're having an impact. Right. Who would have thought Unilever would be having messages around reducing the amount of cocoa that they use or like who would have thought like there would be social uh, impacts to tennis shoe companies looking at using algae? Uh, who would have thought Pharrell's brand um, that's one of the ones that I really like. Um, Pharrell took plastic bottles from the ocean and started using them to make NBA jerseys and Adidas shoes and things like that. When people didn't even know that he was doing it, like he was doing it because it was the right thing to do. And that was his pathway to go to market. And, and you can go to any Nordstrom's and see this raw for the oceans brand. And you didn't even know that he was taking these plastic bottles from a company called Bionic um, out of North Carolina to make these clothes that we that my daughters were paying $45 for a t-shirt for, right? Like, but, 
and willing to pay it because they, like you think about a Patagonia t-shirt or, or one of the other t-shirts that one of these exclusive brands, they're expensive, right? But people are willing to pay for them because of the value of the message. I think that the quality of what it is that you're producing is beginning to evolve. People are asking a much more mature question. The consumer has got more choices, so they're making different decisions. And I think that that's what's driving leadership to kind of move in that direction. So I'm excited about that, for sure. So I'm going to have the last word. That sounds like a one. <laughs> so I want to thank Hot House and the leadership and its Nick and John and Jay and Sheree who really walk the talk as far as what they're doing, what they're trying to do. Um, I also think someone should never leave this earth without getting a standing ovation. So I'd love for everybody to give George Bandy a big. Thank you very much. Grateful, I appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. That's awesome. Y'all check out that Morehouse t-shirt, right? <laughs> yeah.